Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry, I've got to pre-record this lecture and not be in there in person for you. Um, but, you know, things happen and uh, I appreciate your flexibility. Um, we're going to go over the skeletal system today. And then uh, at the end uh, of the lecture material, uh, I'll just have a few words about the upcoming quiz on Tuesday. So, skeletal system. Um, thought I'd introduce it with just a photo there, getting you to think about, uh, you know, bone fractures, for instance. So what we're going to learn about bones um, can be directly applied to uh, something that affects people now and then, uh, and that is how they uh, heal up a fracture uh, when it occurs. I don't know that girl in the picture. I just grabbed a photograph off the web. So um, anyway, I'm sure she's doing well. All right, so... Um, Bone is a type of tissue. A tissue is made up of similar functioning cells. Uh, and because this semester, uh, due to the pandemic, is a little bit shorter than a typical semester, uh, at this time last, uh, in a normal year, I would have taught about many different types of tissues. I would have started with skin, uh, we would have gone into nerves and muscle and, and ended with uh, connective tissue. So um, anyway, the textbook is going to be talking about connective tissue and bone is an example of connective tissue. Um, cartilage is also an example and we'll be talking about cartilage uh, in this lecture. Um, blood uh, we'll be talking about much later in the semester and adipose tissue is just uh, the name that we give fat cells uh, as they are grouped together uh, in and on our body. All right, um, the structure of bone. Uh, there is a lot of um, information on this particular slide and uh, I'm going to refer to study guide number six. Um, which has a list of terms you should know. And so the study guide and the uh, slide here um, with the pictures from the textbook, uh, this is going to help us with all the terminology. And by learning the terminology, we get to understand how bone cells work and how they put together uh, the organ known as a bone. All right, so uh, I'm going to start with um, the center here, the center picture. Um, and we're going to start with this uh, big old bone right here. This is a, a femur. Um, you know, the artist has just drawn a, chosen a particular bone to show us, uh, and this appears to be a femur. Um, up here where I've indicated, that's where the hip joint is, and then down here would be where the knee joint is. Um, this is called a long bone, um, and we have long bones in our arms and legs, um, and they have a particular structure, and we're going to learn that. Uh, other bones like, you know, the breastbone, uh, the clavicles, the bones in our, um, well, actually the bones in our fingers and hands are long bones too. Uh, but there's some unusual bones and we won't get into their structure. We're just going to cover the long bones. And the reason we um, uh, call them long bones is because they have two parts. Uh, the one part is called the epiphysis. All right, now that's an awkward word, so say it with me, even if you're by yourself. Epiphysis, okay? Um, and the epiphysis uh, is the ends of the long bone, uh, and I'm highlighting them now in red. Uh, and let me be a little more careful with my drawing up here because uh, I highlighted more than just the epiphysis. Epiphysis is again this part. Uh, that uh, is at the end. Um, it includes uh, where the joints would be. Um, and, uh, and so there you go. Those are epiphyses. Um, plural is epiphyses. Um, now, the textbook is going to label the center part of the bone, um, the diaphys. And uh, that's another word. We don't need to know that word. So I'm going to cross that word out and just use more of a common day, every, everyday language. We're going to call this the shaft of the bone. Okay, and so the shaft of the bone is uh, in between the epiphyses. Now, what else? Um, what's sort of unique to the epiphyses? either the top or the bottom down here, uh, is the epiphyses have something called spongy bones. So that's another term that you need to memorize and, and understand. 
um, what we're talking about there. Um, and the spongy bone, while it's not soft like a sponge, it kind of looks like a sponge because the spongy bone, if we uh, just take a little section of spongy bone here and, and uh, expand it, um, this is the spongy bone over here. Um, and you'll see that it's bone, but then there's these voids that do not have any bone tissue in them. They're spaces. Uh, kind of like a sponge has space um, that fills with air or water. Um, in the case of the bone, um, the spongy bone is filled with marrow, bone marrow. I'm sure you've heard of bone marrow. Um, and uh, the spaces inside our bones are made of bone marrow. We have two types of bone marrow. One is the red bone marrow. And the red bone marrow is contained here within the spongy bone. So these spaces are filled with red tissue, red in color, and it is a type of bone marrow. Um, my next slide is gonna have some info on the bone marrow, but I'm just gonna make some notes here while I'm talking about it. Um, so the red marrow, uh, contains blood cells. In fact, it makes blood cells. Because our blood cells wear out, sometimes we need more blood, sometimes we need less. Uh, and so there's cells within the bone, um, particularly the spongy bone, uh, that regulates that uh, and makes new cells when, ne when needed. Um, you can maybe remember this because uh, if you know of someone uh, with the unfortunate circumstance of having leukemia, which is a type of, of uh, cancer of the blood, um, people get treated for leukemia um, in a number of ways, but one way is a bone marrow transplant. And so uh, a healthy individual without cancer um, uh, donates their uh, marrow cells, the red bone marrow, uh, and is injected into the body of the uh, cancer patient. Um, so if you've ever, you know, heard about bone marrow transplants and didn't understand why the, what the bone was involved with, um, that's, uh, that's what's going on. So that's bone, red bone marrow. Um, it turns out that the shaft here also contains a, a space or a void, um, and that's in here. It's in the sort of, well, it's a hollow portion of the shaft. And in there, it is filled with yellow bone marrow. And uh, they're named after the colors that one sees under a microscope. It turns out that yellow bone marrow contains fat. And as you recall from last lecture, um, one of the functions of fat is to store energy, and that's what the yellow bone marrow is. It's a, a place where we can store energy for later use. So um, that's, uh, that's what the yellow bone marrow is. Now, another, and, and you might think, uh, or I'm trying to say how you might remember this, um, that there's bone marrow in the shaft of the bone and that it's high in energy. Well, now and then in the Bible, there are verses that talk about um, eating the marrow from bones. Um, don't ask me to cite the particular scripture verses, but, uh, but every time I hear that in the Bible, um, you know, I, people back then didn't have great access to grocery stores and stuff. So they'd, they'd uh, sacrifice an animal and eat it, and uh, they'd eat the meat, of course. Well... Fat contains, for those folks anyway, really needed sources of energy. And so there's fat inside the bones. And so people would break the bones and suck, suck out the bone marrow from the bones. And it would provide them lots of calories that they needed. Uh, and what they were doing is they were sucking out the, the yellow bone marrow from the, uh, the hollow parts of the shaft of bones. So, um, yeah, you can think about bone marrow transplants being for red bone marrow and sucking out uh, the yummy tasting uh, fatty yellow bone marrow 
uh, in the shaft. All right, we've learned four things so far. Two types of bone marrow, and then the parts of the, uh, the maybe the external parts of the bone, the epiphysis and the shaft. We have to keep going. There's lots more on this slide. Uh, next on the list is the periosteum. Okay, uh, and as you can see by the artist's drawing, uh, the periosteum is this layer on the outside of the bone. It basically wraps the bone like shrink wrap. Um, perhaps it's a little thicker than sh shrink wrap, but it is uh, a location um, that contains some bone cells, uh, but it's, it's softer uh, and it's um, protection for the bone um, so that not every you know ding and dent is going to actually damage it. Um, all right, I'll have a little more to say about the uh, periosteum uh, later. Um, let's keep going and uh, there's I've talked about spongy bone uh, but I did not talk about compact bone and the compact bone is you know you have to kind of bend in close and see that the compact bone I'm going to choose a different color here um, the compact bone is this outer layer. I mean, it's not the surface, it's not the periosteum, um, but it is this sort of outer layer of bone. Um, and here's more outer layer of bone here on this side. And in fact, there's outer layer of bone that surrounds the spongy bone as well. And we call this compact bone. And uh, and so it, it has a certain you know thickness to it. it goes from here the uh, periosteum uh, to where the spongy bone is present and uh, and so uh, we need to talk about that structure and what's what's located there the compact bone is not spongy uh, it doesn't have air spaces uh, packed with marrow um, so it has no spaces at all uh, between um, you know the individual bone cells that form it um, so compact bone is stronger uh, and it makes sense that it would be sort of surrounding uh, the uh, the less strong um, spongy bone and and the the you know central cavity of, of the shaft um, so it's it's really uh, at the shaft right here if I were to do a cross section kind of cut this in half and drink the marrow out of it uh, it would basically be a hollow pipe um, and the, the walls of the bone are made of compact bone. All right, so I hope that's clear. The compact bone um, is organized. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll point out the bone cells, the individual bone cells. And they are uh, these little spots in the diagram. Um, so any little sort of brownish spot in here is an individual bone cell. And as you might be able to see, they are organized in these rings. Um, the rings have a name, they're called osteons. You don't need to know that name. I'm gonna cross that out. We don't care about what their name is. Um, but the middle of the ring right here uh, also has a, a void or a passageway um, and it is called the central canal. Uh, so the central canal is going to be right here. Well, I kind of chose a bad color because it blends in with the uh, blood vessels. Um, but in fact, yes, um, there are blood vessels and nerves that go that pass through the central canals. Uh, and so they're hooked up. They're serving the individual bone cells uh, within the compact bone um, nutrients and oxygen, because uh, after all, these are living cells. Um, here is an actual, uh, down here, letter C, uh, here's an actual microscope slide and it shows you um, the individual bone cells uh, and we're going to name them now osteocytes. So um, osteocytes are uh, a type of bone cell. There's actually three types of bone cells. I'm just talking about one on this slide. It's uh, um, it is uh, sort of a 
inactive, we're just going to call it an inactive bone cell. Um, and so uh, these cells are surrounding, they're like organized in a circle, and they're surrounding the central canal. And again, what's special about the central canal? Uh, it's where the blood vessels and nerves pass through. So uh, if you were to break or fracture a bone, um, then you're going to have a crack through this compact bone area, more than likely, uh, and it's going to hurt because you're damaging the nerves there or pressing up against them. Uh, and you're going to have some bleeding and swelling, um, at least within the bone, uh, because you've probably damaged some blood vessels. All right, um, so that's uh, almost everything on this slide that I need to go out over. There are two more words, though, uh, that I need to highlight. Um, we already named the individual bone cell. That's called an osteocyte. And pretty much that's this whole, uh, this whole portion, this purple thing uh, in the artist's drawing. Uh, that's an individual bone cell, fairly inactive. And I'm going to contrast that with some other cells in a second. Um, but there's one more thing. There is something called the canalicula. Uh, and honestly, I don't know how to pronounce this. Um, I remember it because uh, the first part of, part of the word is canal. Um, so we're going to emphasize that because that's going to help you remember what this thing is. The canalicula uh, is a projection from the osteocyte that meets up with other osteocytes. So um, my photograph or my video is uh, sort of in the way here, but there's another bone cell right here. And there's these little projections um, and they link up uh, one bone cell to another. And so that's what all these fine little lines are in here. You got the bone cells, which are a little bit thicker, and then the really fine lines in this drawing up here. Uh, those are the canals or the canalicula uh, that link them together. The canalicula are similar, well, huh, not, not physically similar, but analogous to a seismograph that would measure earthquakes. And I spell this on the next slide. I'm not going to try and spell out seismograph down here um, because I'm probably going to misspell it. So time just to move on to the next slide, I think. All right. Yes, uh, I do have the word seismograph on this slide. So I'll get to that in a, in a little bit while. Um, this is just um, this slide here is uh, reviewing what I've already mentioned verbally. We've got the compact bone, we've got the spongy bone, um, down, and we've got the periosteum, which is the covering. Um, I'll get to the bone cells in a second, uh, but all bone uh, is made of these components right here. Aha, look at that, interesting. So we actually have, uh, we've got Three different types of bone cells, all combined, however, they only make up 5% of any given bone. So there are cells inside the bone, they're relatively inactive, uh, but they're still alive. But most of the bone, 90% um, of the bone, is non-living material. Of that, uh, of that non-living material, we have 20% um, cell secretions, mostly collagen. Collagen is a protein. You've probably heard of collagen. It's um, also found in skin and hair and fingernails. Um, and because it's in those areas that might clue, clue you in on, on sort of what it functions uh, as, what it does for the body, it is structure. It's just structure. It's a stiff material um, that, uh, that prevents us from falling apart. Uh, and collagen does the same thing for bone uh, as it does for any of our other uh, body parts that contain collagen. Um, it's pretty much uh, a 
um, a structure uh, that, uh, that holds bone together. Um, you can kind of think of this being concrete. If you've ever watched them build a concrete road or foundation or something like that, uh, they start with something called a rebar. Um, these are the metal rods um, that they lay down first, and then they pour the concrete, um, and the concrete surrounds the rebar. The rebar um, makes the concrete stronger and prevents it from cracking, um, and so uh, that's pretty much what the collagen does. It sort of links up all the rest of the non-living material uh, which, in the bones case, is calcium phosphate, sort of crystallized calcium phosphate. So back to my concrete analogy, um, the rebar is the collagen and the calcium phosphate is the concrete that you lay down here and, um, and you know, make a side, sidewalk from. Um, so sort of like concrete. I'll write that down so you remember. Um, yeah, so these are, uh, we, we learned about calcium and phosphate last lecture. These, of course, are minerals. We get them from our diet. And of course, collagen being a protein, well, we get that from our diet too, uh, either from the meat we consume uh, or the high protein uh, vegetables and grains that we consume. So bone, I mean, you are what you eat. The bone is containing things that uh, eventually uh, you consume and, and get integrated into the, into the bone. Um, there's a little bit of water there as well. Um, living cells need some water, so uh, the living cells are sort of bathed in some water. All right, it is time to talk about the specific kinds of bone cells. And we've got three types. I've already mentioned osteocytes. The osteocytes are, I, I've called them inactive before, probably the better phrase is less active. Um, they may act like seismographs uh, in detecting vibrations similar to a seismograph detecting an earthquake. Uh, so uh, the importance of that I'll, I'll share with you in another slide or two. Um, the osteoclasts are another type of bone, uh, another type of bone cell. And what do they do? They actually dissolve uh, the mineral content. Um, I should say dissolve mineral. Um, the mineral content of the bone. I suppose they dissolve the uh, collagen matrix as well, but um, but you can just sort of think uh, back to this concrete. Um, they are dissolving the uh, the phosphate and co and, and um, calcium uh, that that contribute to the the solid part of the bone. So you, we actually have living bone cells that dissolve bone. Um, we'll get to why in a little while, uh, but you might not be surprised then if we've got some bone cells that dissolve bone, we also have osteoblasts, which are the ones that form new bone. Um, osteoblasts uh, only live for a little while. Uh, after that, they transition into less active osteocytes. All right, so again, um, a lot of vocabulary here, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, the calcium phosphate and the collagen and these three different types of bone cells uh, in a later slide. Um, let's see. Do I press the space bar? Do I get some animation? Yes, I do. Good. Uh, I knew I had an animated little line here. Uh, so I've drawn in a red line on this photograph of spongy, uh, of, a, of a bone. In this case, it's at the epiphysis. Um, and sort of above the line here is spongy bone. Um, and, uh, and I've drawn the, the line as sort of an arc, okay? Um, arch or arches or arcs, as you know, are very strong 
um, features that can support a lot of weight. And so it's by no accident that the spongy bone is oriented in these sort of arch-like um, formations. That's actually why I put a railroad trestle uh, in the picture here. Um, we're, we have to support the, the weight of this bridge and the train on top of it. Uh, and, you know, they don't just randomly put some support structures down here. It has to be organized in a certain way by engineers uh, to make sure that that trestle doesn't fall down. Um, and the bones are built so that the spongy bone is oriented in a certain way um, that it can transfer the forces um, from, uh, from the top of the bone throughout the, the rest of the bone so the whole bone doesn't collapse. So I wanted to point that out to you. All right, um, here is a slide. I've already covered the types of bone marrow. We have uh, yellow bone marrow, Ta -da! and we have red bone marrow. And I've already told you where it's found. The yellow is in the long bones, remember? Uh, it, uh, it, it contains um, fat. Um, and so you can, you can suck it out of the, the, the bone, the, the pieces of bone that, you know, you've sacrificed your animal and you want to make use of all the calories from that animal. Um, so what is this, its function? Well, it's to store fat so that we have some extra calories should we need them uh, when we go on our next hunting excursion uh, as, a, as a, you know, prehistoric person. Um, the red bone marrow, where is it found? Well, it's found in the spongy bone. And what is its function? That's going to be a B for blood. Makes blood cells. All right, moving on. I want to sort of, don't want to move on right away. I want us to review. If we were in class, uh, you know, I'd be calling on you and making sure you're with me. Uh, this is instead, this is an online lecture. It's 75 minutes, probably less. Um, but, uh, but you're going to be tuning out once in a while. I understand that. Um, but got to stop it right here. All right. So I want you to draw yourself a long bone. And then without cheating, without looking, go and try and label that long bone. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm never going to see these drawings, so don't judge yourself. You can just draw a bone like this. All right. And um, these things I want you to label um, where they would be located in the long bone. These three other things uh, we'll, uh, we'll add on to after you've done your drawing. Okay, so do it. Stop the video and draw yourself a bone. Try and uh, put that in your memory where all these different parts are. Did you stop the tape? Okay, I'm assuming you did. So hopefully uh, you remember that the periosteum um, is sort of, you know, oops, I didn't do that very well. Let me get rid of that line. That's not very helpful. Uh, the peristeum is on the outside covering. The compact bone is going to be um, the next layer of the bone. And then the spongy, and, and we have compact bone here too. Uh, and then the spongy bone is going to be uh, in this area and over here. What about the epiphysis? There's actually two of them. One is going to be right here, this end, and the other one is going to be right there. And the red bone marrow, where is that located? Well, it's located within the spongy bone. So uh, I'm going to fill that in with little pieces of red blood cells because that's what the red bone marrow is. And that leaves us uh, the yellow bone marrow in the shaft. And so uh, here's some yellow bone marrow. Um, I don't know how we want to draw that in, but just kind of globs of fat in there um, within the shaft, which is, of course, 
this part. I have put, now I don't want you to think about these as just random words that you have to memorize. I have put them in a certain order. Do you see that? Um, the compact bone, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, well, the peristeum is like the outer layer. Then you get to the compact bone. Um, and then if you're at the epiphysis, you, you find your way into the spongy bone. Um, so I sort of started with those two items. Um, the spongy bone, the epiphysis, and the red bone marrow, they all go together, right? Because here is the epiphysis. And inside the epiphysis, we have spongy bone. And inside the spongy bone, we have the red bone marrow. Uh, and then I put these two last on our list because the shaft contains the yellow bone marrow. So uh, link these ideas together. Don't just do flashcards and do them at random. I mean, flashcards are okay, uh, but link them together and it's a lot easier to learn that way. Okay, uh, let me review those three other words. Osteocyte. Do you remember what that is? Yes. You're like, it's one of the three blood uh, bone cells. It's one of the three. Which one is it? Is it the one that dissolves bone? Is it the one that builds bone? Or is it the one that's just the least active? It's kind of the most common uh, bone cell, and it's the latter. It's the most common, least active bone cell. And again, it is uh, organized. Those individual cells are organized in circles that surround the central canal, okay? And the central canal, what does that do? Oh yeah, it's where the blood vessels flow through. And lastly, we have the, speaking of canals, the canaliculi, um, different kind of canal here, all right? Uh, this canal refers to where the blood vessels and nerves are. Uh, the canaliculi are the links, the physical links between um, the bone cells. So there's kind of a there's kind of a link in between these cells, and there's also here's another layer of bone cells. There's going to be some links between those two, and those are called the canaliculi, and those remember are our seismographs. And um, again, I'll figure out I'll, I'll I'll teach you about the seismograph function in just a little while. But that's our review. Okay because that's going to be on the quiz. All of this is going to be on the quiz. Hope you're with me. We'll move on. I need to tell you about cartilage briefly. Cartilage is not bone. Um, it is similar in construction to bone because you actually have cartilage cells, living cartilage cells, and I'm just highlighting a few. All these little bubbles are the cells. And those cells are surrounded by non-living material, uh, also containing collagen. Um, but it doesn't contain any minerals, so this collagen remains flexible throughout your life, uh, flexible or rubbery. Um, I have a picture of Jello fruit salad uh, because if you go to any church function where they serve food, there's usually uh, a dish of Jello with little pieces of fruit embedded in the Jello, and this is great. Any time I eat Jello with fruit in it, I'm like, oh, this is like collagen. And of course, everybody else looks at me strange, but it's like, oh, biologist. Um, and so all the little pieces of fruit are like. Um, cartilage cells surrounded by the actual jello, which is this rubbery um, material uh, that, um, that is, is somewhat flexible. Uh, and it's not a bad, uh, this is not a bad um, analogy at all, because it turns out that jello, the food, contains protein that we get from collagen. So, uh, it's an animal product, uh, Jello is, and um, when, I don't know, the cows go to slaughter and we harvest the meat from them, we also harvest their, their uh, cartilage, and that is sent to some factory that makes Jello. Huh, 
I don't know if you're going to eat jello after this, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a great analogy because that actually is like cartilage, um, plus or minus some pieces of fruit. Anyway, uh, I needed to cover cartilage because cartilage is important when we're talking about bone development. When we are growing our bones or repairing our bones, uh, cartilage is involved. So I needed to mention that. Um, cartilage is involved uh, in other cases too. We have them uh, in discs between our backbones, um, which just absorb uh, compressive force as we're walking around. Uh, we have cartilage uh, on our um, bone surfaces uh, that, that sort of um, reduces friction. Uh, and if you break down your cartilage, then you're going to get uh, arthritis, for instance. Um, we have cartilage in our, you know, at the base of our ears and our base of our nose um, and like in our chest area as well. So cartilage is found in lots of different places. Uh, but we're going to talk today about its role in bone development. And one other note, um, cartilage does not have a blood supply, uh, and that's different, remember, from the bones because um, the bones have those central canals with the, uh, with the blood vessels that, that uh, go through them. So if we do damage or fracture a bone, the bones heal. Sometimes it takes a little while for them to heal, but eventually they heal, and they are, I promise you, they are as good as new. If cartilage is damaged, then it takes even longer to heal, and oftentimes it's not complete um, because there's no blood supply. You're not able to get nutrients and oxygen uh, to those damaged areas uh, to rebuild it. So um, you've got to protect your cartilage as best you can. All right, yeah, so I had to talk about cartilage if I'm going to talk about bone development. And um, here's some text on the slide that's going to describe a picture in your book, figure 5.2 in your text, uh, which is going to show up on your screen momentarily. Um, but I'll just talk you through it for, uh, for the first go around. Um, and we're, we're following the development of bones from scratch, all right, from the fetus. Uh, and, um, and so even at, you know, a, a two-month-old fetus in the womb, um, it is now going to have um, a, a skeleton, uh, a growing skeleton. It's not going to be made of bone, however. It's going to be made of this flexible, rubbery cartilage. Uh, so the textbook's going to call it a model, um, and so and that's just indicating that it's not it's not the fully constructed bone yet. It is uh, sort of a um, you know a, a prototype. Yeah, it's a prototype. In fact, maybe that's a really good word. I'm going to write that down, prototype. Okay, so um, that's what a fetus of less than two months is going to look like if you were to uh, examine its internal structure. Um, after two months, um, then the conversion of that cartilage to bone begins. And this is a very long process. Uh, so even as a child, um, some of the bone, bone tissue uh, in a child is still made of cartilage. Um, so I shouldn't even call it bone yet. It's uh, some of the bones. <laughs> oh boy, it's confusing, right? Um, even in a child after birth uh, has some rubbery portion uh, of their arm. It uh, provides a lot more flexibility um, and and it just takes a long time to be converted to actual solid bone. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, in the fetus, after two months, um, the cartilage that was there begins to dissolve, and it is replaced with bone. And here's where that slide where I was talking about 20% um, collagen and 70% calcium phosphate comes in. Because these things don't all form at the same time. Uh, the protein, the collagen, forms first. So this protein is, remember, the collagen. And again, um, we're going to have these bone cells. And they are going to secrete, that is, they're going to make collagen and then transport it to the outside of the cell. 
and it's going to uh, sort of radiate out from these bone cells. Uh, I know my picture is going to start looking like a sun um, with, with sun rays, but you can, yeah, you can think of that if you want to. Um, it's just that we have a bunch of bone cells here, and they're all making collagen. And the collagen bumps into each other, and it forms um, you know, a, a, a pattern. Um, it's actually the technical word is it forms a matrix. And the matrix is just these fibers that are all um, overlapping with one another. Uh, remember, the collagen is sort of like the rebar in a concrete sidewalk. Um, you, you lay down the, the, st the structure first, and then you fill it in with the, mineral, uh, the, the minerals. Um, so in fact, uh, that's what's going to happen. Once the, uh, uh, os once the bone cells have made the collagen, then they begin to secrete uh, calcium and phosphate. Uh, and so they're secreting calcium and phosphate into these areas between the bone cells. So this bone cell is secreting calcium and phosphate. This bone cell is secreting calcium and phosphate. This bone cell is doing that as well. And eventually it all fills in and you get all bone, you know, a hardened bone um, surrounding uh, individual bone cells. Now, I haven't used the names of these bone cells yet, uh, but you remember on the previous slide, I talked about osteoblasts with a B, osteoblast. You remember how they only live 15 to 20 days? And then they convert themselves to osteocytes. And the reason that happens is because it's the osteoblasts that are the ones that are producing the bone. And so they're the ones that are secreting the protein and the calcium. And once they have done their job, they're done. They filled in all the space between all the other osteoblasts. Uh, and it, it turns out then that they're done secreting their their secretions and they just turn into these less active osteocytes they still are alive they're still connected with with one another because of those uh, canaliculi um, but uh, but yeah that's that's what happens the osteoblasts get converted to osteocytes uh, as soon as they've finished okay once you're uh, born uh, you are a child and this uh, this conversion um, from cartilage to uh, bone continues. Um, you get uh, compact bone forming. You also get spongy bone forming. They start at different sites within the bone. That'll be obvious from the picture. Um, they grow together and eventually uh, you have mostly all bone. Um, but as an adolescent, you haven't finished growing in height. And so you still have to have a little bit of cartilage um, in order to lengthen those bones. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Let me show you figure 5.2. And figure 5.2 is showing this process that I just described um, verbally. Uh, we start with the uh, cartilage model or prototype. That's this stage here. It's just all cartilage. Their artist is indicating that as kind of a light blue color. Um, after that, at uh, you know, age two to three, um, we begin to see some conversion of that cartilage to bone. And so the um, author, or the artist, I should say, is trying to indicate that with these little pieces of compact bone that are starting to form. Okay? All the rest of this is cartilage, but we have pieces of bone starting to form where the cartilage is dissolved and the, the osteoblasts are beginning to form new bone. Um, all through the rest of fetal development and into childhood, uh, you can see now um, that the uh, bone material is uh, forming the shaft of the bone, and then you get some spots here in the epiphyses uh, that are also uh, forming um, the spongy bone in this case. Ultimately, you get to this stage here, adolescence, where 
Uh, nearly everything is bone. Um, here to there, as well as the whole, you know, epiphysis with the spongy bone in it. In it. Um, but there remain some layer of cartilage, and these are called growth plates. So there's one at this end and one at that end. Let me show you a picture of this cartilage growth plate. Um, first of all, I'm going to get rid of my writing. Um, here's on the x-ray. Uh, you can see uh, this is somebody's uh, wrist joint. Um, the actual bone, I'm going to highlight here. Um, actually, let me redo that because I didn't mean to exclude this part. So here is the actual bone. Obviously, another bone is right here. So we got the radius, and I'm just uh, highlighting the ulna now, the smaller bone in the forearm. Um, but uh, and so this is this is the you know lower arm bone. But I want to highlight the fact that there is uh, on the X-ray you have this darker area right here, and there's one on this bone right here too. These are the growth plates. And the growth plates look like this uh, on the uh, in the under the microscope. Um, so uh, this right here is the growth plate. Um, all this blue stuff, uh, and that means too. Also, point out uh, the bone um, is. Uh, you know, one, towards the epiphysis, this is bone, and then this is bone down here as well. So this growth plate, take a look inside this growth plate. You have individual um, cells of cartilage. Uh, they, uh, they're in layers. Um, you know, I can't do this very carefully with my mouse on the screen and stuff, but there, the cartilage forms layers like so. Uh, and I want you to think about these layers like a deck of cards. I happen to have my Star Trek deck of cards, yes, with all the wonderful characters of Star Trek, like Mr. Spock, yes, okay. I have to get back to human biology here, um, but uh, deck of cards. Um, so this is like the layer of cartilage, okay? Um, and again, this is a growth plate, which indicates that it grows. It helps lengthen the bones, right? Because a small, smaller child, you know, their arm is shorter, and as they grow, uh, the arm gets longer. That is accomplished by uh, adding cells to the growth plate. So up here, hmm, how do I indicate it? Um, maybe I'll draw a black line. Right in this area, we are growing new cells, and the cells uh, are replicated in a certain direction. And so the new cells that form are pushed downward um, and as you're adding new cells, well, then that pushes the epiphysis away from the shaft, uh, and that ends up lengthening your bone overall. So uh, I'm not going to start with a full deck of cards here to illustrate a growth plate. I'm going to start with a smaller deck of cards. And what happens is, again, these are uh, layers of cartilage. And they're going to replicate, and they're going to add layers of cartilage cells to the bottom of this deck or stack of cards. And of course, the more cards you add to the bottom of the deck, um, the thicker the layer is, and and the more tissue you have, and the longer you know the bone, the the ends of the bones are going to sort of be pushed a farther and further apart as you add more and more cartilage to your your deck of cards. All right, so now I've got a fully developed um, growth plate. 
Uh, and now what happens is um, over time, uh, the, uh, the older portions of cells, um, you know, I just added layers beneath and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start converting these bottom layers, or the oldest ones that were, uh, that were created early in the child's um, life. Um, I'm going to convert that to actual bone. Okay, so this layer gets converted to bone, and this layer gets converted to bone, and this layer does, and this layer does. And sooner or later, all the cartilage layers... are going to be converted to bone. And at that point, you are finished growing because you can't add bo any more bone now uh, without that layer of cartilage. And so uh, you have a growth plate, and that growth plate uh, in late adolescence is starting to narrow uh, because uh, all of these cells right here are converting to bone. And uh, these cells here, the ones that uh, were replicating, they stop replicating and eventually they become converted to bone too. All right, so um, if we were in class, uh, I would have made a bigger mess of my playing cards, um, but uh, hopefully you get the point there with that analogy. That is how bones develop from fetus to infant to child uh, to adolescent and finally to a fully grown long bone that's no longer growing in length. Um, I just inserted another picture here. This is actually from my uh, um, stepdaughter, Kendra, uh, the one that I just took to the doctor for you know, some other uh, ailment uh, this morning. Um, at any rate, uh, she had uh, some pain in her foot. They took an x-ray of her foot, um, and there wasn't any fracture or anything like that, uh, but uh, I kept the photo because, take a look, um, there are growth plates here. This is Kendra at age 12. And um, here's growth plates in her toe bones. Here's the one of their toe bones, and the growth plate is this section right here. So all the long bones uh, will be elongating um, in this way, including your fingers, your toes, uh, your hands, your feet, your arms, your legs. Um, it's interesting, so this part here is her actual foot rather than her toes. This is um, the inside of one's foot. Uh, here's the outside of one's foot. Um, this looks like a fracture here, but that's um, it's, it's not. It's actually another growth plate. It's kind of interesting that she still has, oops, I meant to use a different color. Um, she still has a growth plate right here on that, on that particular part of her foot, um, but the rest of her foot seems to have all converted back to bone, and I don't see much in the way of cartilage here anymore at all. Um, so uh, her foot was still growing on one side of it, like her, by her little toe, uh, and it had stopped growing on, uh, on the side of her big toe. Weird! I don't know whether that's weird or not, actually. It's probably normal. All right, so fully grown bones. Are, are bones then completely just inactive at that point? The answer is no, because we use our skeleton all the time for movement, uh, and sometimes we encounter forces uh, or, or sort of change our behavior so that we are um, putting forces on our bones that is different today than it was yesterday or different uh, you know, this month than it was the month before. Um, so the bones have to constantly remodel or renovate themselves to compensate for new forces that are applied to them. Uh, a, a quick or a good example uh, is from your textbook, in figure 5.4, uh, they're showing a, a femur here again, here's where your hip would be, down here is where your knee is. Um, and so uh, here's a, a person's femur that might just have a sort of a natural curvature to it. Um, and in this case, as they're walking around on their, uh, on their leg, um, this, this uh, compressive force from their body weight, uh, and because of the curvature in this bone, 
um, there's actually more force experienced on the curved part of the bone and less force experienced on the outer side of the bone. The artist is trying to indicate that with the thickness of these arrows. So a thick, area, a thick arrow on the inside, a thin arrow on the outside. Well, um, you know, that, if that were to persist, if that's going to be uh, the, 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 the outcome, anytime you're putting uh, you know, body weight on your bone, um, then your bone probably should modify itself, modify its shape, uh, so that all parts of the bone are receiving equal force. Um, this will prevent it from, you know, breaking. Uh, and, um, and so that's what's pictured here. We go from sort of a curved femur to one that's much more straight. And because it's much more straight, the force is experienced by both sides of the bone, the inside and the outside um, surfaces, uh, are equalized. How this is accomplished is by... Uh, removing um, some excess bone where it's not needed. This side of the bone wasn't receiving that much force, so you don't need that much bone on that side, and you're going to add it to the inside here uh, where it was experiencing a lot of force. And by adding new bone in one spot and removing it from another, uh, you're straightening out that bone, you're equalizing the force, and you're making it overall a stronger bone, more resistant to fracture. All right, let's go back, think about when we're removing bone or when we're adding bone, there's certain cells that are involved. So what cells do this? Well, in terms of adding the bone, that's the osteo, osteo, try and name it, osteo with a B, blast, osteoblast. The osteoblasts add the new bone. Um, and it's the osteoclasts with a C that are tasked with removing the bone. So, uh, you know, when I first told you about osteoclasts, you're like, uh, I mean, I, I expect you were like, well, what in the world do you need bone cells that dissolve other bone for? And this is what, you're, what it's for. It's to remove the bone that's not needed um, and allow that material then to be uh, used by the osteoblasts. Um, so this is an illustration of bones constantly rem remodeling themselves. Um, they're using the femur as an example, um, but it, this applies to all bones of the skeleton. Let's pretend, for instance, that uh, I actually I'm not. I am not a tennis player. Let's pretend that um, this summer. Uh, I think, oh, tennis, that seems like fun, good exercise, uh, and let me, let me take that up as a sport. So if I were to do that, um, you know, I'm moving around on my femur, you know, get one place to another on the court, um, so that very well could lead to changes in my leg bones. Um, but you don't need body weight to, uh, to trigger this remodeling. Uh, all you need is force and your muscles pull on the skeleton. That's how you physically move your arm. Uh, you've got muscles in the arm that are pulling on the bones in the arm, uh, and that's, that's what leads them to move. So if I've got a tennis racket and I'm swinging that racket a lot, uh, then my arm muscles are pulling on the bones in a certain way, and that could be the force um, that is uh, triggering the arm bones to remodel themselves and strengthen where needed. Um, because, uh, you know, I've got a shoulder here and the muscles of the shoulder might be pulling in a certain way on the upper arm bone called the humerus. Uh, and you don't want to fracture um, there. And so the bone has to strengthen in that particular spot so that the muscle can successfully pull on it and move your arm. Um, so regardless of what physical activity you're doing, what muscles you're using, whether you're using body weight or not, uh, your bones are responding to changes in force. Um, and that is where the seismograph comes in. Uh, we've talked about osteoblasts on this slide, osteoclasts are there. Don't forget about the less active osteocytes.
um, because the osteocytes have this seismograph function. They are actually the ones that are sensitive to the forces. Um, so if you're pounding around um, then the, uh, with, with your body weight on a tennis court on your legs, the osteocytes in the, in the, in the bones of your legs are going to detect those vibrations. They're going to detect the fact that there's extra force on one side of the bone and less force on the other. Uh, so the osteocytes have a role in directing where the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts go and do their work. So that's one way that bones remain active through adulthood, even after they've grown to full size. They have to constantly renovate themselves to, uh, to adapt to different forces placed on them. Um, now, if too much force is placed on a bone, uh, it will fracture. Uh, I don't have time today uh, to go over all the different kinds of bone fractures there might be. Um, I do have this slide just to sort of list all the different types um, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and, uh, and the way that the fractures are repaired uh, does not differ depending on the type of fracture. So when somebody says they broke a bone, when somebody says they fractured a bone, when somebody says uh, it, it's, it's the same thing, you know, we're just talking about damage to a bone. Um, sometimes there's people who say, um, oh, I just cracked a bone, I didn't break it. Um, that's not a technical distinction. Uh, to the orthopedic doctor, you fractured a bone. Um, a crack, uh, is caused by you know unusual forces and it heals the same way as a as a, a broken bone where it, it snaps into two um, now uh, a broken bone where it snaps into two much more complex it's going to take longer to heal but the healing process is the same so it's just a matter of degree whether you cracked a bone or broke a bone or had a hairline fracture or um, uh, there's things called compression fractures where you you are struck by an object and it, it kind of crushes the bone, um, the healing process is the same. Uh, and that's actually true of this other uh, type of bone fracture called a stress fracture. I uh, wish I could get into this. Um, I can talk to you individually if you have questions about stress fractures. Um, but those uh, other things that I mentioned, you know, like where bone breaks in half, I mean, that would be due to a traumatic event. Um, you know, you do a fall, you're hit by something, you know, like a car, um, you know, bad stuff happening all at once, uh, damaging your bone. Um, there is also a fracture called a stress fracture, which happens over time. Um, continuous, repeated stresses that your body is not used to yet. Um, you get a, what's called a stress fracture. And that all has to do with the fact that the osteoblasts are trying to respond to those extra forces, those new forces that your body is experiencing. Think about the previous slide. You could get a stress fracture in your leg uh, if, you, um, if the remodeling process doesn't go quick enough to, uh, in, in relation to the activity level that you have. Um, so a stress fracture is just um, going to happen uh, because you have osteoclasts that are dissolving the bone um, in some spots and osteoblasts that are trying to form new bone, and it, it doesn't form the new bone fast enough to uh, accommodate uh, the, the new stresses. So that's a stress fracture. But again, healing process is the same. So here is the healing process for a fracture. I'm just going to, uh, here's an x-ray I got off the internet. Um, so again, these are hand bones um, in the palm of your hand. Uh, and I can see uh, right here, there is a fracture of the bone right here, okay? Um, so, ow, that's going to hurt. Um, within hours uh, and days of a bone fracture, uh, you're going to have cartilage um, form. You're going to have other cells that we haven't learned about, but they're going to go in there and form cartilage. And in this x-ray, uh, it's been a number of days since the bone fracture. I know this because there's quite a large sort of ball of cartilage uh, that has formed around this fracture. This is pretty much to splint 
the site of the fracture and to keep it from moving um, anymore and, and getting, you know, hurting and, and getting even more damaged. So it's to keep the two pieces of bones from shifting. So that's what the cartilage does. It surrounds that site of fracture. Well, the osteoclasts now, these bone cells that dissolve bone, are going to go in here and dissolve the damaged area. Because when you have a fracture, boom, you are damaging uh, bone cells, you are cracking the non-living material uh, that was surrounding the bone cells, you are also probably damaging the blood vessels and nerves uh, that pass through the bone. Um, all of that has to be cleaned up. You, uh, your, your body is just going to put that in the recycle bin and, and take it up, absorb it, uh, and, and, um, and use, use the raw resources to build new bone. Um, and so the osteoclasts are there to, to clean it up. Um, you know, if a blood vessel was damaged, for instance, um, I'm going to use uh, yellow as a blood vessel, even though they're not really yellow. But, um, but anyway, here's a blood vessel, uh, and the fracture goes in here, and it, uh, it, you know, cuts off a blood supply. Well, you could have um, this whole part of the bone right here even though it wasn't damaged in the initial fracture, it could start to die uh, because the blood supply was cut off. Um, well, uh, you know, and that's bad. We don't want that to happen, but it happens. And so it's the osteoclast's job to go in there and absorb that damaged bone. Um, and, uh, and again, you sort of make a, now you have a space um, that no longer has any bone in it at all. And that space then has to be filled in with uh, the osteoblasts and their secretions. And as I mentioned, when I was talking about just the um, growth of bones from child to adult, you start with the protein collagen, putting down this uh, you know, matrix of collagen fibers being secreted by all the osteoblasts in the area. Uh, and then after 10 to 15 days or so, uh, that gets filled in with the calcium and the phosphate. And now you have brand new bone um, to replace what was damaged. All right, so you've fixed the uh, fracture. Uh, we'll move over here to the right. Um, you no longer see any fracture. Uh, in this area, I don't see any fracture, um, but you still have the callus material, the cartilage that was serving as a splint. And over the next two months, um, that cartilage will also get dissolved um, because it's not needed and your body doesn't want to maintain tissues that are not needed. So it's going to dissolve uh, and, uh, and be used elsewhere in the body. That's the usual case. It, it might also be that some of this callus gets converted to bone. Um, this is how uh, doctors can sometimes look at an x-ray um, and see that you've broken the bone in the past. And the reason they know that is uh, some of that callus gets converted to bone and it's just a thicker part uh, of the bone. So that's uh, how a fracture is repaired. Let's review. Here's some questions. Here's stuff I've covered since the last review. So I want you to stop the video and ask yourself these questions and try and figure out what the answers are on your own um, so that this is active learning and you're not just watching TV here. So uh, fetal and childhood development, what are the steps to building bones? Think about that figure with the cartilage model um, and how the bone fills it in. Um, I'm giving the answers away. I shouldn't do that. Uh, what are the growth plates? Where are they located? How do they work? How long do they last? In other words, um, eventually they disappear, right? Because uh, the bones stop growing in length. We're adult size. Uh, and so um, they, they last as long as, uh, you know, the end of, of puberty um, and adolescence. Um, puberty is kind of the start of, of becoming an, an adult. Um, so, I mean, there might in fact be some of you that are still growing, um, if, particularly if you're a freshman male, uh, the, 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 the young men um, keep growing uh, through a longer or older age than the women do. Um, but anyway, uh, you're, you're clearly going to stop growing uh, very soon if you haven't already. 
Are bones active in adulthood? The answer is yes. Uh, we've covered the remodeling process. How do the bones respond to new forces, such as if you were to take up a new exercise? How are bones repaired after injury? And what bone cells are involved in all of these processes? Um, the osteocytes and the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts, they all have roles. Uh, and I want you to think about the role that they have uh, in childhood and fetal development, um, the role that they have in the growth plates, the role they have uh, in the bone remodeling of adulthood, um, the, uh, uh, the role that they play in the repair of fractures. Okay, so stop the video and review that uh, if you don't know the answers to all those questions. Test yourself. All right, just three more slides. We're almost done. Homeostasis. We talked about that the first uh, day of class. Um, it is a sign um, or a, a characteristic of, of life, living thing, uh, that it maintains homeostasis. And so here's the, de the dictionary definition of homeostasis. Maintenance of relative constancy of the conditions of the internal environment. Um, so uh, relative just means that there might be a range. You know, so for instance, very common for us to use body temperature as an example of homeostasis. 98.6 degrees is average body temperature in Fahrenheit of, of human beings. Um, but I tell you what, huh, I actually have a thermometer right here, just because I check my own thermometer every day like we're supposed to. Uh, and I can guarantee you that my body temperature is not 98.6. Yikes! <laughs> Uh-oh, uh, it's 99.1. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be 99.1. I, I usually run cold. Um, but uh, 99.1 is, f you know, half a degree warmer than average, um, and that's okay. Uh, it's not uh, not a COVID fever yet, um, but uh, but obviously there's some range. Your body will get cooler sometimes, get warmer other times. Some of you run hot, some of you run cool. Crazy! I hardly ever run, uh, you know, uh, um, run a little mild temperature like that. I'm going to do it again. 99.0. I guess I'm just generating heat by talking here. Okay, moving on. Um, hopefully I'm, I'm well. I'm going to monitor that out now. Uh, okay, so relative constant, there might be some, you know, range that you don't want to get out of, um, but some variation around an average is fine. Um, if we're going to use body temperature as an example, uh, then, um, then, which I will, uh, then we're going to go over some terminology here. We're going to have sensors, set points, control center, and some effectors. Um, this is all working through something called negative feedback. Um, and this is where deviations from normal, in other words, if I were, um, you know, 100 degrees, uh, then that's, that's a deviation from normal. That's warmer than what your body wants. Um, then your body will then act uh, to counteract the high body temperature. So it's going to do something, for instance, sweat, uh, to cool you down. So I, I'm pretty sure body temperature homeostasis is already familiar to you. Uh, here is a diagram um, that, uh, that puts it in a, in a pictorial uh, way. Um, and now you can see why it's called um, uh, negative feedback, negative Feedback and often they're called loops because uh, it goes in one direction. It's a loop and eventually it feeds back on itself uh, to get it back to normal. So um, the graphic on the left is what happens when your body is too cold. Um, so we're indicating a, a core temperature uh, below normal. So normal is, is the set point is, is what normal is. Um, and so the set point 
is your normal reading, what your body prefers. And if you are uh, got a lower body temperature, then your body's going to detect that with special sensors. And, um, and they're just special sort of uh, nerve cells that are sensitive to heat. Um, and they're going to send a message to a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. You don't need to know the word hypothalamus. Um, you could just think of this as the brain. Anyway, you've got a sensor sending information to the brain that says, hey, brain, I'm detecting uh, you know, uh, 100, or, um, I'm detecting a 92 degree body temperature. And the brain is going to be like, oh my gosh, 92, that's lower than my preferred body temperature of 98. Uh, and so the brain then sends a signal to these things called effectors. Um, at this point, I'm not going to uh, ask you to commit the word effector to memory. Um, but in the textbook, uh, as you read about it, they're going to use this word, effector. In this case, um, effectors uh, are the thing that return the temperature back to normal. So the effector returns um, is a, um, a body part that counteracts uh, the, the cold or the hot, you know, the, the being away from the set point. It's a body part that um, returns the condition to normal. Uh, I'm trying to, my writing here isn't very good, I understand, but hopefully you're taking your own notes. Um, all right, so in this case, your brain understands that it's too cold. And so what's the effector? The effector is going to be the skeletal muscle, and the skeletal muscle is going to shiver to generate heat. Um, it turns out your body has other ways of generating heat too, or at least conserving heat, and that is to constrict blood flow to the skin. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, but anyway, it's this loop, and it feeds back on itself to try and correct uh, the situation where the uh, uh, temperature is, is um, away from the normal reading. Uh, and then over here on the right side of the screen um, is what happens when your body is too warm. Um, everything is the same. You have uh, sensors that detect that you're too warm. It tells the brain that you're too warm. Uh, and then the brain does something about it. It sends a signal uh, to the sweat glands to say, hey, you should start producing more sweat. And that through evaporative cooling will cool the body. Why am I going through all this? Well, because uh, your bones are involved in calcium homeostasis. It's not body temperature in any way, shape, or form, but homeostasis just has to do with the internal environment, and, and temperature isn't the only thing that has to be regulated. Calcium has to be regulated. You need calcium um, for uh, proper digestion. You need calcium for proper um, uh, well, bone growth, of course, you need calcium for proper nerve conduction and muscle contraction. So you have to have a certain amount of calcium in your blood. And, um, and I'll just make a note here, this is in blood. And uh, you don't want to, you know, just like body temperature, you don't want to have too much calcium or too little calcium. It has to be within a range because uh, otherwise things aren't going to work right. So we're worried about calcium. Your body has a sensor. Um, it's also a special nerve cell that detects how much calcium there is, believe it or not. Um, and then your body, you know, also has this sort of preconceived set point. Your brain somehow knows what amount of calcium is appropriate, and it can then distinguish whether you're too high or too low or just right. If you are uh, not um, within the normal range, um, this is a little extra detail here, uh, but I wanted to throw it in uh, because it talks about osteoclasts, and that's so much fun. Um, if, uh, if you're not in the normal range, your brain, your control center, sends a message 
to a hormone gland um, called the parathyroid gland. Again, you don't need to know that. Um, to produce a hormone, and that hormone then uh, increases the activity uh, of the osteoclasts. Now, remember what the osteoclasts do. The osteoclasts, do they build the bone or they dissolve the bone? They dissolve the bone. And what does bone contain? Well, 70% of it is calcium and phosphorus. So a lot of that non-living bone material is calcium. And by dissolving that bone material, you are returning the calcium back to the blood, which will then increase the amount of calcium in the blood. And that's what your body wanted because we were starting out being low. Uh, so let me take this body temperature loop and we're going to sort of alter it uh, not to be core temperature, but instead um, blood calcium. I'll just say CA for calcium. Um, blood calcium is too low and your sensor detects that. It tells your brain that it's too low. The brain sends actually a signal to a hormone gland. Um, so I'm just gonna write in here um, that uh, we're just adding a box, okay? Um, and this is gonna be um, a gland. And then the gland is sending a hormone throughout whole, the whole body uh, to the osteoclasts in the bone. So this is in the bone. And the osteoclasts are there. They're going to dissolve calcium from the bone. And guess what? That calcium enters the blood and will rise or raise the blood calcium level higher until it gets to the set point. All right, yay. Um, so again, uh, biofeedback, homeostasis, these are really important concepts uh, that we'll get into for the whole rest of the semester. Um, there are some implications to this particular, that I've chosen to use calcium um, for this uh, because osteoporosis, actually I'm getting ahead of myself, because um, we're going to talk about disorders of the skeletal system uh, next week. Um, but osteoporosis is a, a case where there is um, too much osteoclast activity. The bones uh, get brittle, um, and you're going to have basically too much uh, calcium in your blood. So that's one, one way they can uh, uh, identify osteoporosis. So anyway, um, if you don't quite get why this is important, uh, it'll, it'll make more sense to you uh, next lecture. Okay, um, before I end, uh, I should have put a blank slide in here uh, so I can talk about your quiz. Um, but first of all, uh, I'm going to have a quiz review session. On Sunday night. And I have to see what time I wrote that in. Oh, no, I didn't write it in my calendar. I think it's at 7, but I will send you a, a reminder for sure. 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, obviously, I'll, I'll have to send you a special link for that um, on Sunday. And we're, um, I'm going to entertain all your questions and, and go over uh, anything that you need uh, to be you know, reviewed. Um, I'll have some self quizzes, uh, like uh, uh, the quizzing software that you can, you know, it's kind of fun to compete against students and stuff like that. Um, so we'll do that on Sunday evening. Uh, in the meantime, you should start studying now anyway, because how, how do you know what your questions are uh, if you haven't begun to study? So you should study um, all the study guides that we've covered so far. So. Make sure you study the study guides. Hmm, I wonder why I named them that. Study guides. 
we have done number one and we have done number two. We have done number three. And because of the strange semester schedule this year, I skipped four and five. Um, but, uh, but now with this lecture, we've just finished study guide six. So you have four study guides to study. That's a lot of material um, for only 20 points, right? So I'm having you study a lot of material and I'm not going to be able to ask you questions on all of it. Um, 20 points, it's going to be multiple choice um, for probably 12 points of that. Uh, and sort of fill in the blank, short answer, label diagram sort of questions for the remaining eight points. I'll just call that short answer. And it's uh, also very good of you to review uh, those questions at the back of your textbook chapters. Okay, so uh, that's how you start studying. Hopefully you've already done the reading because uh, you're going to need to do the reading if you haven't already. Um, and I will see all of you on Sunday night. And if you can't make it to our 7 p.m. Zoom on Sunday, uh, I'll record it and you can watch it uh, when it's convenient to you. All right, this is Dr. Kellum signing off. Have a good day.